Hello. Whenever archaeologists want to compare contexts within an archaeological site or to compare archaeological sites with each other, uh, they do that typically in terms of comparisons of the artifacts that are found in those contexts or plant remains or animal bones or something like that. And in some sense, every artifact we find in those contexts is unique. So in these two stone tools, for example, they're somewhat similar to each other, but they are entirely unique in many other ways. If we did a very a series of measurements on them, for example, uh, we would find the measurements would differ one from the other. Now, archaeologists do make numerous measurements on artifacts like this, and indeed we do identify ways in which these artifacts are unique. But if we actually treat artifacts as unique all of the time, it actually makes it pretty difficult, if not impossible, to make comparisons between contexts and archaeological sites because uh, inevitably we end up deciding that they're different from one another when in fact we often want to look for similarities among those among those sites or contexts and one of the simplest ways we could do that is by by using descriptive statistics descriptive statistics allow us to do things like identify what a typical artifact of a certain type looks like so you know is this artifact fairly typical for its type or is it kind of an outlier um, and also allows us to figure out how much variability there is in an artifact assemblage or zoo or archaeological assemblage or whatever the case may be. So in today's video, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the main kinds of descriptive statistics. One class of descriptive statistics is called measures of central tendency. These are statistics that describe what a typical artifact or animal bone or whatever it would look like. Uh, and, so in, and it's a univariate measurement in most cases. So that univariate means it's on, measured on one scale only, such as length or thickness or mass in grams, something like that. And um, if we decide, for example, that a, a typical artifact in an assemblage it has a length of 12.6 centimeters, we're not saying that there's any artifact in the entire assemblage that's exactly 12.6 centimeters. What we are saying is that most of the artifacts are kind of around 12.6 centimeters. So there are a number of measures we can use that help us make that kind of decision. For our first example, we'll pretend that we have artifacts from excavations at archaeological sites in the fictitious land of Middle Earth. This bar graph shows the frequency distribution of tool stone sources for the stone tools from our hypothetical sites. Since the scale along the x-axis is a nominal scale, that is, it consists only of categories, the mode is simply the most abundant category. In this case, the x-axis is on a discrete interval scale, consisting of whole numbers of obsidian tools found in each context. In such cases, the mode is just the highest bar, in this case, the bar indicating two obsidian tools per context. Things are more complicated when we have a continuous ratio scale along the x-axis, as in the case of this histogram of artifact lengths. We could identify the mode as the middle of the highest portion of the histogram. However, there's a problem with that. As you may recall from my video on graphs, the shapes of continuous histograms vary considerably depending on our choice of bin sizes. As you can see in these four graphs of exactly the same data, varying the width of those bins changes the number, location, and width of the peaks on the graph. Consequently, the value of the mode also depends on those decisions, although in this case it varies only slightly. One other problem with modes as a measure of central tendency is that some distributions don't have one clear mode. In the case of this bimodal distribution shown here, neither the highest nor the second highest peak is particularly central to the distribution. A very useful measure of central tendency is the median, which divides the distribution into two equal halves. In our example of the numbers of obsidian tools, the median is a little to the right of the mode at three obsidian tools per context. This indicates that half of the archaeological contexts have three obsidian tools or less, while the other half have three or more obsidian tools. The median can even work for ordinal scales, but it is not an option when all we have is a nominal scale, as in the case of the distribution of toolstone from our fictitious archaeological sites from Middle Earth. In cases like that, 
all we can do is identify the mode, or perhaps the two or three most abundant categories. The median works particularly well for continuous ratio scale data. In this case, the median divides the area of the histogram into two equal halves. And unlike the case of the mode, the median stays the same no matter what bin sizes we pick for our histogram. The most popular measure of central tendency is the mean. And in perfectly symmetrical distributions, the mean is equal to the median. But in this example, we see that the mean is slightly higher than the median. That's because this distribution is asymmetrical and the high values at the right end of the distribution are pulling the mean to the right. The mean is kind of like the center of gravity of the distribution. A small number of extreme values in one direction can counterbalance a larger number of values much closer to the mean in the other direction. No doubt you're already familiar with how to calculate a mean because it's exactly the same thing as the average. In the statistical equation for it, the large sigma sign simply means that you sum up all of the x values to its right. Then you divide by n the number of observations in your sample. In summary, the mode is just the most common category in a nominal or ordinal scale, or it's the peak of a distribution on an interval scale. The median, also called the 50th percentile, is simply the value that divides your distribution on an interval or ordinal scale into two equal halves. And finally, the mean is sort of a center of gravity of the distribution and is equal to the median whenever the distribution is perfectly symmetrical. Each measure of central tendency has strengths and weaknesses. The mode is virtually our only realistic option when all we have is nominal scale data to deal with, but it has the disadvantage of ignoring most of the information that's available to us. The median is actually a pretty good measure of central tendency because it's a robust one, meaning that it's not sensitive to outliers. It also takes into account the entire distribution. The mean also takes into account the whole distribution, but it's not a robust measure, especially for asymmetrical distributions, because it's highly sensitive to extreme values. However, it is the key measure of central tendency in statistical tests that depend on the normal distribution. Whenever we have a skewed distribution like this one, the skew pulls the median away from the mode and pulls the mean even farther away from the mode. However, the median still divides the distribution exactly into two equal halves. Before we leave central tendency, I want to mention one more measure of central tendency that's probably less familiar to you. This is the trimmed mean. The trim mean helps to compensate for the mean's sensitivity to outliers by cutting those outliers out. It involves ignoring equal numbers of the highest and lowest values and only averaging the values that remain. For example, the 90% trimmed mean is the mean of values that remain after you cut out the lowest 5% and the highest 5% of the values. This makes the trimmed mean more robust than the common mean. If we were to calculate a trimmed mean on normally distributed data, for example a 95% trimmed mean by cutting out the lower 2.5 and upper 2.5% of the distribution, we would get exactly the same result as the common mean. By contrast, we would get quite a different result in the case of highly skewed data, like this distribution with a median of 17.2. The ordinary mean of this distribution is 22.9. That's quite a bit higher than the median because this handful of high values is pulling the mean to the right. However, if we trim out the lowest 20 and the highest 20 values and average the remaining 90% of values, we obtain a trimmed mean of 19.4. That's still higher than the median, but it's a lot closer to the median than the ordinary mean is. Generally speaking, it's not enough for us to know the central tendency of an assemblage of artifacts. We also want to know whether most of the artifacts are pretty close to that value, or is the assemblage pretty spread out in, their, in the values that, we've, that we find. So going back to our example of the length of an artifact that has central tendency of 12.6 centimeters, we want to know are most of the artifacts pretty close to 12.6 centimeters, or is there quite a lot of variation? So some descriptive statistics have to do specifically with variation in a sample or a population. 
For nominal scale data, it's not obvious how to measure how spread out the data are, and archaeologists have usually dealt with this problem by using measures of diversity, which I discuss in another video on quantification. For the moment, I'll only mention the simplest measure of diversity, which is called richness. It's simply the number of categories for which you have at least one observation. In this example, with 12 categories, only 10 have observations, so the richness value is 10. However, richness is a measure that suffers from bias due to sample size. If we had a larger sample, it's quite possible that richness would increase to 11 or 12. Consequently, it's a rather poor measure of dispersion in data sets. However, there actually are measures of qualitative variation around the mode, although they're not much used in archaeology. Probably the simplest of these is Wilcox's variation ratio for the mode, or mod VR. It simply involves summing all the differences between the frequency of the modal category, in this case 66, and all the other frequencies. However, the same value could result from either a small number of large differences or a large number of small differences between the modal category and the others. Consequently, there are several alternative measures for spread around the mode, and I'll provide some links to those in the comments area below the video. For interval and ratio scale data, the simplest measure of dispersion is called the range. It's simply the difference between the lowest and highest values in your distribution. In this example, the data ranges from 0 to 8 obsidian tools per context, so the range is 8, because the range is just the maximum value minus the minimum value. In this example, with a continuous ratio scale, the range is 102.2 grams. But you can see why the range is not a very satisfying measure of dispersion in the data. In a skewed distribution like this one, the range alone would not give you any idea that most of the data is lumped between 10 and 30 grams. That's because the range ignores all the data in the distribution except for the lowest and highest values. In cases where we want to express the amount of dispersion around a median, the most common measure is the interquartile range, which is simply the difference between the 25th and 75th percentile. In other words, it encloses the middle 50% of the distribution. In the case of this discrete data, that would be the difference between 2 and 4, or an interquartile range of 2. An alternative that's less familiar to archaeologists is called the median absolute deviation. It's just the median of the absolute differences between the median and each individual value. When we compare these two alternatives, the median absolute deviation is more robust than the interquartile range. However, the median absolute deviation doesn't work as well as the interquartile range in cases where the distribution is highly asymmetrical. However, the two measures also differ in their symmetry around the median. The distances from the median to the lower and upper boundaries of the interquartile range do not need to be the same, but the median absolute deviation is always symmetrical around the median. The measure of dispersion we see most commonly associated with the mean is the standard deviation. It's the square root of the variance, and we calculate it by finding the differences between each individual value and the mean, squaring those differences, summing those squared values, and then dividing by the sample size minus 1 before finally taking the square root. The standard deviation is the measure of dispersion we'd most commonly use in conjunction with the mean whenever we have a normal distribution or a distribution that's pretty close to being normal. However, like the mean itself, the standard deviation is not a very robust statistic. Because it involves squaring the distances from the mean, outliers or extreme values have an extremely large impact on the value of the standard deviation. In principle, we could use standard deviation or median absolute deviation whether or not we are using a median or a mean. However, it's more common to use the standard deviation with the mean and the median absolute deviation with the median. When we compare them head to head, the median absolute deviation is a much more robust measure because it's much less influenced by extreme values. 
But if we're concerned about the impact of those extreme values, but still want to use a mean, one option is to use a trimmed standard deviation along with a trimmed mean. Just as we can base a trimmed mean on the middle 50% or middle 90% or middle 68% of a distribution, we can also calculate the standard deviation on the base of that middle part of the distribution. Finally, sometimes we want to standardize our measure of variability in a sample. The most common way to do this is to divide the standard deviation by the mean, which is called the coefficient of variation. This makes our measure of variability independent of the scale of the measurements. By analogy, one could divide the median absolute deviation by the median. However, that's a measure that you don't tend to see. Instead, you're more likely to see a measure called RCVM, which uses a scaling factor of about 1.48 to make it more comparable to the coefficient of variation. One further major class of descriptive statistics consists of proportions or percentages. Because we use these a lot in everyday life, you don't tend to think of them as any kind of statistic, but in fact that's exactly what they are. These are a class of descriptive statistic that is particularly appropriate when we have measurements on a nominal scale, but we can also use them on ordinal scales and even discrete interval scales. Proportions are a kind of descriptive statistic that does not have to do with either central tendency or dispersion. Instead, it has to do with the relative frequency of different categories in a set of categories. It's simply the frequency or number of observations in each category divided by the total number of observations for all categories. So, going back to our fictitious example of stone tools from Middle Earth, the 28 tools made from Evan Deem Chert translates into a proportion of 0.18, or about 18%. While we most commonly use proportions in the case of nominal and ordinal scale data, because they consist of categories, we can also use them for discrete interval scales. Going back to this example we used earlier, we could say that the proportion of contexts that have exactly three obsidian tools in them is 0.2, or 20%. And the simple equation for calculating a proportion is simply the ratio of the number of items falling into a category I divided by the number of items in all categories. And to convert a proportion into a percentage, all we do is multiply it by 100. Proportions also have standard deviations, but the way we calculate those standard deviations differs from those that we calculate for a mean. We just multiply the proportion by the difference between that proportion and 1, and then take the square root. For 30%, for example, we would simply multiply 0.3 times 0.7, which gives us 0.21, and then take the square root to get 0.46. The closer a proportion is to 0.5, the larger its standard deviation will be. So far I've reviewed or introduced you to a number of descriptive statistics that you could find useful. However, I haven't really talked about how you interpret these things. Like, what do you do with them? Certainly they help to describe a sample or a population or an assemblage, but so what? What do we want to do with that? Um, most typically, we want to make comparisons with other assemblages or samples. And this is where the statistics come in. However, once we do that, let's say we, have a, a, we find a new assemblage of artifacts, and when we measure, say, the mean and standard deviation of the artifacts in that assemblage, we notice that it's a little bit different from the uh, assemblage that we analyzed before. How do we know if it's different enough that we want to conclude that it's really a truly different kind of assemblage, or is it just you know, kind of within the normal range of variation? Well, the descriptive statistics I just talked about are the first step for doing that. In fact, this brings us into the realm of what are called inferential statistics, which allows us to do things like compare the means of two samples to find out whether they are statistically different from one another or not. There are also Bayesian approaches to this that I don't have time to discuss today, and in fact I'm not going to discuss inferential statistics at all in a serious way in this video, um, but um, Bayesian analyses can also help us decide whether or not a new assemblage is sufficiently different from a, the previously known one that, would allow, that it would allow us to conclude that there really is something interesting happening here and that this really is a truly different kind of assemblage, or is it just kind of a, a 
within the normal range of variability for a larger group of assemblages. In classical or frequentist statistics, some of the more common comparisons of samples are difference of means tests and difference of proportions tests, which can use things like the t-test or the z-test for analysis of variance. In principle, you can also compare medians, although normally you do this with a non-parametric test, such as a runs test, a signs test, or a kruskal wallace test. In some cases, we might be more interested in comparing the variation in two samples. In those cases, we might compare the sample's standard deviations or median absolute deviations. However, these topics stray away from today's topic of descriptive statistics, and I refer you to my other video on probability in archaeology for a brief introduction to some of these. I hope you found that brief introduction to descriptive statistics helpful. Even if you've had some background in basic statistics, the odds are pretty good that you haven't been very familiar with things like median absolute deviation, a statistic that's not very common in archaeology, even though it's very useful and really should be used more often. If you'd like to learn more about these topics, please have a look at chapters 1 and 2 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, available from Springer. And also, if you'd like to be updated as I produce new videos, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.